And today, I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker and opening keynote, Teresa Siangatonu. Um, woo! Woo, yes. Um, Teresa Siangatonu's presence in the poetry world as a queer Samoan woman and activist has granted her opportunities to perform in places ranging from the UN Conference on Climate Change in Paris, France, to the White House. Off stage, Teresa creates and facilitates workshops, leads artistic and professional development trainings, provides mental health, mental health clinical support, and delivers keynote speeches across the country on issues that inform her 10 plus years of community work involving youth advocacy, educational attainment, Pacific Islander indigenous rights, climate change, LGBTQQIA rights, gender-based violence, and others. She holds a bachelor's degree in community studies and minor in education from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a master's degree in marriage family therapy from the University of Southern California, aiming to use her background as a mental health clinician and a poet to bridge the gaps in our quest for collective healing and liberation. Teresa's writing blends the personal, cultural, and political in a way that calls for healing, courage, justice, and truth. And just this past weekend, she was also a keynote speaker at the Women's March in San Francisco, y'all. So I want Highline to help me get up on your feet, help show some love, and give it up for Teresa Siangatonu. What's good, Highline College? How you feeling? What's good with it? Uh, I hail from the rural town of Oakland, California. Uh, and I'm so hella hyped to be here with you all today. And uh, give it up for the committee who put on the MLK Convocation for 2019, y'all. Thank you, Edwina, for that beautiful introduction. Um, uh, uh, uh. 13 years ago, family, I was in my college dorm room in UC Santa Cruz and I wrote my first poem. It was really, really crappy. <laughs> 13 years later, um, I'm blessed to say that I've made a career out of this because I followed every whisper in me that said, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Hear me? So uh, I want to ground my talk first in actually offering up a few poems to you all, if that's OK. Is that cool? So y'all can definitely speak back to me because I get a lot of energy from the energy I get from audiences I perform with and am in conversation with. So if you hear anything that you like, you can do things like snap your fingers. Let me hear you snap your fingers. You can pretend like you're taking a big bite out of something really delicious and you can say, mmm. <laughs> you can say things like, okay, sis. Okay, sis. Fuck it up, sis. <laughs> so, my bio says I was a community studies major. I was actually an ethnic studies major. Um, and so I went to a predominantly white institution. Um, and the city girl, island girl that I am, it was a big culture shock in a lot of ways. Um, I was very uncomfortable for the whole four years uh, I was there until I found a sense of community with other students of color, like the beautiful students of color in this room right now. Um, and I, I found poetry through that too. In college, I used to sit in the back of the class with the other students of color and listen as my white peers theorized the hell out of the oppression that we were born from. Buzzwords like institutionalized oppression, class warfare was sugar on their tongues, sweet and comfortable. Words from a language my community didn't even know existed because we were too busy living the realities of them. You see, it's one thing to major in ethnic studies, y'all. It is a whole nother thing to be the reason for its existence. You see, for the white students in my major, ethnic studies was like a free study abroad program that didn't require that they bring their baggage with them a privilege that is easy for them to close in their textbook at the end of class. You see, my life is beginning to feel a lot like a free ethnic studies lecture with no tenure. <laughs> is this what they meant by public education? But study my racial profile till it exhausts you. Study how black has been made to feel like the green light for stop and frisk. Study how brown has been made to feel like the much needed check stop at any given border. Ask me what it's like to have my skin be made to feel like a nuclear missile we all know is coming, and he still won't know what it's like to sit in the back of a class and be studied because of how tragic your history is, as if we've only been brought in to be dissected, as if frogs, rats, 
And people of color can only be understood when you cut them open. You see, with ethnic, study, ethnic studies, it is not school anymore. It is a lesson in survival. I'm so tired of playing teacher with my oppression. If I'm not doing it on a stage, I'm doing it from the margins of a classroom. I'm doing it from the margins in my notebook. Always on the margins of something, never the core. Never asked to be anything more than what makes it easy to feel sorry for. You see, it's easy to avoid confronting the things that make us feel uncomfortable, the things that make us feel guilty. Who chooses to walk through the war zone if you were told that you don't have to? If you grew up believing that there isn't one? If what you don't know won't kill you? Race is the rent I pay for this skin. So the belief that racism doesn't exist anymore, especially in my own major, is when I feel the foreclosure of this home taking my knees from right under me. You can't claim that racism doesn't exist if you've never known what, to, what it means to survive it. If you keep looking at the war zone like a teaching moment you're not ready to learn the lesson from, a comfort zone you're not willing to sacrifice. You see, it's easy to avoid confronting the things that make us feel uncomfortable, the things that make us feel guilty. But comfort is what kills us in the long run, y'all. Comfort is sitting down when you should be on your feet. Comfort is staying quiet when you should be speaking up. Comfort is speaking too much when you should be listening. Comfort is building borders for safety, but not bridges for healing. Comfort, comfort is celebrating diversity, but never discussing it as if a black president was enough as if a heritage month is enough, as if ethnic studies is enough, as if this poem is enough. Comfort is sitting in the front of the class, forgetting that we're all sitting right behind you, wanting to remind you that the war zone still exists, wanting to tell you that this isn't comfortable for any of us. There's a difference between feeling uncomfortable about talking about racism and actually experiencing racism and experiencing these really big um, systemic issues that Dr. King died fighting for, that Dr. King became too radical for, uh, for our society to the point where white supremacy killed him. And I named that intentionally because we, we tend to whitewash and tend to rosy color uh, his legacy in ways where all he wanted was what it was us to get along. That's not all he was about. Did anyone in this room feel what I'm talking about? Yeah. There was way more to his legacy than that, right? And so I'm just honored and blessed to be given one of the many platforms that you all um, get to experience this week of speakers and, and programming um, in honor of Dr. King's legacy. Uh, something I wanted to clarify about my bio, I performed at the White House during the Obama administration. Uh, I feel like, <laughs> Uh, for whatever that's worth, too. But I'm just saying that I think I need to clarify that even more. Um, anyone ever heard of something called PTSD? Yeah. So I didn't know what PTSD was until I got to college. I knew I experienced it once I learned the language of it. I grew up in a housing project in San Francisco, and I moved around a lot. But I didn't know what post-traumatic stress disorder was until I studied it, which is pretty wild, right? And so another poem came out, came out of that, uh, that new knowledge. So I'm learning a lot about this thing called post-traumatic stress disorder. This wartime disease, this combat fatigue diagnosis, and I read something somewhere that I thought was worth sharing with you all, fact. Urban youth are twice as likely to get post-traumatic stress disorder than soldiers who are coming home from war. So tell me, what is the difference between homicide in the streets and bloodshed on the battlefields of Iraq? a battalion of young soldiers who meant to sign up for the football team and not the military. They're all wearing black RIP hoodies like the triangular folding of this country's flag, a gift to the mother of the fallen. The only difference there is between a tank and a police car is the speed in which innocent civilians can run when profiled. So the new Jordans you're wearing double as a fashion statement and combat boots. Purple hearts that my students wear every time they are wounded at war on their own streets. 
the way police sirens sound too much like oncoming missiles whistling in the distance, the way siren lights don't mean to look like flash grenades, the way the night doesn't mean to camouflage their skin into enemy soldier. AK-47 is just another way to identify the apartment number of the boy who just wants to make it to the bus stop tomorrow morning. This is all making so much sense right now. Why I continue to confuse my mother's hugs for a straight jacket every time she touches me. The way my high school students are beginning to look a lot like the aftermath of a promise, broken at the knees, lined up for duty, sitting in desks, waiting for what will come first, death or the school bell. It all comes down to simple arithmetic. If you ask me, watch. When you watch one 13-year-old witness as three of his friends get their brains blown away on the corner of where the avenues meet the flats in the span of one month, how much will it cost before we stop wondering why he does not give a shit about school? When is his teacher gonna stop sending him to the principal and start sending him to the counselor? Why did we fire the counselor, y'all? What happened to the art classes and PE and the health center? Because trauma is an STD. It is a socially transmitted disease, meaning my trauma is your trauma. Her trauma was always mine. And that's what it means to be in a community. The only difference there is between a soldier with PTSD and one of my students with it is that the soldier gets to leave the battlefield, which they should, but my kids go home to it. So if they never really exit the trauma, and cycle through the cacophony like the broken record of a drive-by shooting that never really ends. And they don't really have post-traumatic anything. None of them are living long enough to tell their own stories. And for those who do, they'll grow up hallucinating themselves into thinking that every human touch that comes into contact with their skin is actually a lieutenant colonel dressed in camouflage with a boot to their neck and a semi-automatic pointing to the backs of their heads, resisting the urge to pull. Check, check, check. Can y'all hear me back there? Y'all still with me, family? Cool. Hi, my name is Teresa. Um, so, I, I want to appreciate Edwina for appreciating the land that we're on, because we both come from the same uh, Samoan Islands, which is also a product of being a, an occupied territory. And so I want folks to sit with what does that mean to uh, have to reconcile with doing this work, going to school, living your life on land that does not belong to us. And some of us come from communities where we did not choose to come here. We were sold here. We were bought and sold here in ways um, that are so atrocious that we st also still have to reconcile with. And I, I named these all in intentionally because these are things that, again, Dr. King's legacy um, illuminated so much in the ways that he has critiqued the US empire, imperialism, capitalism, poverty, and whatnot. And so thank you so much for grounding us in that. Um, family, it is not lost on me that we are living, barely surviving, and experiencing quite literally some of the greatest crises of our lives. In the same breath, we are also experiencing the ex expiration date on what limited time we have on this earth to come together before the entire existence is wiped out by climate change. Y'all he heard of climate change? <laughs> I say this not as hyperbole. I say this first simply as a daughter of the Pacific Islands, as someone who was born in the diaspora of my Samoan community, traversing realities between what it means to have been born and raised in a state like California, where we go entire years being deathly dehydrated from the constant droughts we experience, to belonging to a people from the Samoan Islands whose islands are predicted to be underwater before I can even explain to my children where we come from. The point in me bringing this up first is to ground us further in the immediacy of this moment, of the limited timeline we have to grapple with all that is staring us in the eyes, all of the devastation, the death, the heinous acts of violence in all its vile forms, the evil driving us to every war and the money that funds our weapons for them. The guns in our schools and the guns in our sanctuaries. The hopelessness in our communities and the intergenerational trauma in our families. The pain in our children and the pain in ourselves. All of these and more stir our spirits to the point of sleeplessness and hopelessness, begging the question, what will it fucking take, y'all? What will it take for justice to be truly achieved? What will it take for us to heal 
And are either of these even possible in a time like this? Questions around the possibility of healing is, is exactly what brought me not only to poetry, but it also brought me to the pursuit of a master's in marriage family therapy. Because I realized that as therapeutic as poetry can be, it is not the same as therapy. Both are avenues towards healing, but one paid more and came with employment that guaranteed health insurance. <laughs> I'm just keeping it real. At the time, and with my deep love for studying the intricacies of all things trauma-related, I thought it was absolutely necessary for me to get a degree in studying it more in depth, followed by obtaining the training necessary to practice therapy with clients and tackle real life issues with them that were bringing them to points of mental distress in the form of depression, anxiety, but most of all, unprocessed and unhealed trauma. Has anyone in this room ever experienced any of those three things? Depression, anxiety, or trauma? Yeah, same. What happened in my beginning years as a therapist, though, did indeed teach me more about trauma. It taught me just how much healing I needed from my own trauma, alongside working with clients who came with trauma of their own. Unlike the injustices that Dr. King spent his life and died fighting against, were the power dynamics of those injustices placed marginalized people in the crossfires of them, trauma is a different kind of injustice altogether, family. In terms of who it targets, trauma has no power dynamic or political agenda. It doesn't discriminate the way racism and sexism and transphobia do. Meaning when trauma wants to mess with you, no matter who you are, what your socioeconomic background is, if you're a citizen or not, no matter any of that, trauma will mess with you. It will quite literally change not only the function of your brain and physiological makeup, it can alter both altogether. We are not the same people we were prior to experiencing a traumatic event. Imagine what that must mean for those of us who experience compacted and complex traumatic events over and over and over again. Those of us who've inherited the historical and intergenerational trauma of our communities, along with our own personal struggles, and have now adapted to carrying it with us to work, to class, in our romantic relationships, in our friendships, and in our self-worth. What makes trauma feel like the grave injustice that it is, is in our response to trauma and the access we have to resources and coping mechanisms to respond to it. But when you come from communities like the ones I grew up in, where mental health resources were scarce and seeking help for your personal battles with depression and anxiety wasn't anything your community did, you're left to reconcile with things that you once used to turn to your entire village for. But what does it mean if your village has historically never been equipped to handle and support the kind of suffering that the evils of white supremacy, colonization, poverty, sexual assault, and chronic stress put you, your mind, your body, and the entire village through? Last year, 2018 seemed to deplete the spirits and energies of so many people around me, including myself. Did anyone else have a hella hard 2018? What was that? <laughs> we've known, we've known it's been pretty treacherous in both this country and worldwide, but there was something in the air that was particularly sharp, unavoid unavoidable, and brought on its own world of suffering to so many of us last year. For myself, personally, I found myself involuntarily admitted into a psychiatric unit due to suicide ideation coupled with intense feelings of anxiety and depression. When I say trauma isn't discriminatory family, what I mean is that it was Father's Day and I was looking my parents in the eyes telling them I didn't want to live anymore. What I mean is that a few months earlier, my grandpa died and then less than a month later, one of my best friends from college died. And I was obligated to return to a work environment that was incapable of allowing me to properly grieve these huge losses in my life. What I mean is that I presented as so high functioning I'm not crying, I lost my place. <laughs> I presented as so high functioning throughout all this grief and trauma and distress, going from performance to performance to keynote to keynote, that not enough check-ins were happening on behalf of my well-being, only on behalf of my productivity at my workplace and in my community work and in my artist's work. To this day, I look back on my hospitalization and the ways in which it sent a blaring alarm ringing through my entire village of support, and I actually felt very little shame about the ways I needed to be truly human with them. 
Time spent in the psychiatric unit gave me time to read and reflect heavily on how none of my community activist work or energy that I spent tending to the wellness of so many other people meant anything if I kept feeling hopeless about wanting to stick around long enough to live through its impact. Family, when I think about this year's theme of nothing to lose, preserving humanity in the face of trauma, I am reminded that I survived last year because of my intense desire for a more critically connected relationship with my village of people who loved me, starting with never going back to hiding what I was struggling with and how I need them in order to survive. Dr. King reminded us that we cannot preserve self without being concerned about preserving other selves. Isolation in a world that is okay with us suffering in silence rather than remembering the healing power of the village that we come from is nowhere close to being our destiny. I survived 2018 mostly on the strengths of sisterhood and radical collaboration with people who, when I paid attention to improving the quality of our relationship with one another, the quality of my entire life improved immensely as well. So much so that I truly believe that is why I'm in the highest of spirits I've been in for quite some time right now. The more I let them in on my healing process, the stronger I got and the more able I was to be there for them and theirs. My life around not just prioritizing community organizing meetings and busy work, but prioritizing the quality of those meetings and prioritizing time spent mending wounds with loved ones, reconciling ruptures with people who harmed me and those I harmed myself. And even being at peace with relationships that no longer serve a purpose that requires a connection as strong as before. I felt so grounded in the power of possibility and redemption by the end of last year that when a mentee of mine came to me last December expressing her own feelings of suicide ideation and asking that I help check her into a psychiatric unit, much like the one I had just been discharged from six months earlier, I was immediately reminded that in our times of total darkness, we still outstretch our arms, reaching for one another with no expectation of a light in sight. Just the hope that before we give up, someone will reach back to us. We are at a point in our lives, family, where to large degrees, it feels like our collective trauma is outpacing the mental health support that is not only available to us, but available in a way that effectively meets our needs. Our coping mechanisms are moving us through the day by day and barely keeping us above water. And if we're lucky, our loved ones have enough capacity to hold us while also holding themselves. In moments where I'm on the brink of becoming overwhelmed by the monstrous size of trauma and the way it leaves us all dysfunctional and perpetually in states of woundedness, I'm reminded as to why Dr. King so desperately tied our global stability as a community to the eradication of poverty. He says that the only thing that is new about poverty is that we now have the resources to get rid of it. And yet, we don't. And yet, most of the wealth is distributed amongst the wallets of a handful of individuals at the expense of millions of working people and families. There is no deficit in human resources, meaning there is no reason for poverty anymore. The deficit, as Dr. King warns us, is in human will. In Dr. King's last book, entitled Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, he literally left amidst the civil rights movement to go to Jamaica, rent a house with no telephone line to write this last book. And it's only been available to us in the past decade. In it, he talks about how white America has yet to pay the full price of justice because there aren't, they aren't even psychologically organized to address injustice, that they only seek to make it less painful and less obvious, but most respects, they'd rather retain it. Family, now more than ever, we need all of us vigilant. If this is a long game, which it is, then we need us leading us to the end of it. We need us when we win, meaning we need us pacing ourselves for a lifetime spent demanding, not asking, not requesting, but demanding the justice we deserve. We need us eating better, drinking water, and giving back to this land in ways that it's given back to us for centuries if we expect to continue to do this work on this soil together. We need us pr prioritizing our health by intrinsically tying our well-being to that of everyone around us. 
living by the notion that when we're better, our community gets better too, and vice versa. Not all of us have the same idea of justice in mind, and we must reconcile with what we do with that reality. With every excruciating, painful, violent, and deadly day spent under the current administration, where we are fighting to stop ruptures between families on indigenous land and on our basic human rights, this work is hella hard, y'all. But yes, this work has always been the same. As Dr. King's writings teach us, this is not our first experience with injustice. This is just the first, and quite frankly, only chance we have left to address this as the moral crisis of our time. This is what happens when a system that was never designed to protect all of us operates just as it was meant to do. And I truly believe, now more than ever, that we cannot reform, fix, or change a system that was never broken to begin with. It must be burned to the ground. And when we do it, y'all, when we burn that, when we burn that we believe, sorry, when we burn what we believe we desperately need in order to survive, we are forced to reimagine an entirely new world that is beyond our comprehension. One that is so wild, it has the possibility to free us all. Some may think we are ridiculous or naive for thinking that we can reimagine a world that frees us all. But I will say this, family. This is the closest description I have for you on what it feels like for me to write and perform a poem. When I wrote my first poem at 18 years old during my first year in college in 2006, I felt the way a deep exhale feels once it leaves a body that has been keeping that singular gulp of air in for far too long. I felt every secret journal I kept throughout my childhood resurface atop the bravery of my bent fingers, <laughs> tapping my laptop keys into a freedom song. When I wrote my first poem, I wrote my way out of my own silence. And then I started writing a lot about my experience with being a first generation queer student of color on campus. I started writing about my Samoan identity and the pride I have in being Samoan, while also writing my way out of the fears of being a disrespectful daughter amidst a Samoan culture that is so rich and so beautiful, but also has very strict rules when it comes to young people voicing their opinions and expressing themselves. And I started performing these poems all around campus, with every stage I performed on, I felt my ancestors giving me permission to stretch the muscle of my voice around the mic. When I wrote and performed my poetry, I imagined being this brave for the rest of my years in college. Brave enough to feel as intelligent as my white classmates. Brave enough to fight my imposter syndrome with the reassurance that I deserve to be a student. Brave enough to quiet my own demons that try to punk me into believing that what I had to say wouldn't matter to anyone else but myself. In a society, in this country, and in a world where speaking up on behalf of your own truth and using your voice is punishable by persecution and death in some corners of the world, I have learned in very deep ways that as frightening as it can be to speak, staying silent about things that matter to me is an alternative that I will not survive through anyways. There's a reason why the biggest fear in this country, y'all, is public speaking. The second biggest fear is death, which is why the ongoing joke is that people would rather be in the casket than to give the eulogy at the funeral. As a poet, arts educator, and mental health advocate who has dedicated my entire life to liberating our people through helping them to utilize their voices, I have learned that the opposite of speaking up about things that matter isn't silence. The opposite of speaking up about things that matter is complicity. It is complacency. It is bystander behavior in a world that needs more people to intervene and speak up, even if your voice trembles when you do it, even if the professor questions your own lived experiences as if you aren't the expert in them, even when you get it wrong when all you're trying to figure out is how to be a better ally, even when your white privilege or male privilege or cisgender privilege or able-bodied privilege or class privilege or citizenship privilege or any other privileges you hold whispers for you to take the easy way out and ignore those who suffer the consequences of your choice to not only say nothing, but do nothing either. If I learned anything from my own grapplings with trauma and the things I stand to lose if I don't preserve my humanity in the face of it, it is that our role in the movement work is that we truly will not make it without each other. This is the village, 
We have to keep holding the hope for everyone else that a better world is not only possible, y'all, we are working on it. We are creating it. We're calling people in and holding people accountable. We're tearing down old and failed ways of power and building new ones that serve all of us. We're leading conferences and teaching each other new skills through workshops we've created. We're reading each other's testimonies of survival and watching it live for the entire world to witness declaring hashtag me too. We are gardening and leading the charge on food justice and teaching the wealthy that climate change exists and it's only a matter of time before they realize that they can't eat their money. We're rehabilitating our people instead of depending on the prison industrial complex to do it for us. We're showing up at airports and delaying flights, interrupting ice rates to put our bodies on the line for one another. We're writing poems about it and translating them into languages our elders can understand. We're thinking up choreography for it that everybody is able to get down to based on their own ability status. We're strategizing it into existence, even in the face of a society who tells us we should just shut up already. We should just keep quiet that we're too young and too millennial to know what we're talking about. A society that tells us we should stop inconveniencing people with our protests and our marches and student walkouts. We should just put the camera phone down and just trust those in power. What they want you to forget, family, is that you, we are the ones in power. Almost every great societal movement in the history of this country was brought about by people who realized that the justice they deserved was not going to be handed to them. They had to go out and take it. And we have to accept the fact that we all may not be around when it comes, but that we hope that our children will be, and their children will be, and so on. That's what justice means, to actively demand equity, even if it's not for you, even if you'll never know when it arrives, even when you're the loudest person in the room and only one person tells you that they heard what you had to say. It's much bigger than all of us amidst a world who keeps trying to convince us that we will be fulfilled if we just worried about our own well-being and not each other's, if we just keep quiet about our pain and never reach out about our own suffering. It's exactly what James Baldwin meant when he told Dr. Angela Davis days before her trial in 1970, if we know, then we must fight for your life as though it were our own, which it is, and render impassable with our bodies the corridor to the gas chamber. For if they take you in the morning, they will be coming for us that night. This is what it will take, family. We exist in a time where we need each other now more than ever. None of us are free until all of us are free. So let's get free, y'all. I leave you, check, 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 with one last poem, and then I think it's open to Q&A. This poem begins with a quote. Thank you so much, Highline uh, College family, for having me with you all this week. This poem begins with a quote. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to... Is this on? Okay. Can y'all hear me? I'm going to start again. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Lucille Clifton. I'm still alive because I'm not afraid of what I already know wants to kill me, y'all. Because I'm a first generation, queer, Samoan woman, four chapters of a survivor story excavated from my bones, the reason your oppression doesn't know what to shoot first. I'm still alive because they C-sectioned me out of my mother's middle in spite of knowing my gender. They think that blood is the only thing a woman loses the moment she gives birth to a girl. My gender never belonged to itself. When it's raped, America does this funny thing where it tells me I was asking for it at the same time that it tells me to stay silent. The hemline of my skirt is an overactive jury that treats my body like a courtroom, that treats my voice box like a closet that they say I deserve to die in on the floorboards of my sins because I fell in love with a woman made an altar of her body since no one else ever has. I'm still alive because everyone deserves to be treated like they're worth a holy offering, a sacred thing it is, y'all, to find and know God in the last place homophobia would ever think to look, a back door into heaven after being put through hell for having the faith of a faggot, a dyke for a daughter, the names your community calls you in a language that isn't the one that they immigrated here with. 
I'm still alive because most days, y'all, I let the trauma write all of my poems. Because saying them out loud on the stage is the first step towards getting help. Because I trust a microphone on a mic stand in a room full of strangers before I'll ever trust the police. This stage is both sanctuary and emergency room. My people are both griots and doctors and patients with no patience left in them, just stories with skin, too dark for sympathy because no one ever considers our pain an American tragedy. I'm still alive because I watch Oakland every fucking day pick itself up from its own concrete, scrub the blood out its cracks before the new neighbors arrive on blocks that their mortgage used to own, a white hipster's wet dream next to a BART station that Oscar's daughter will never have the stomach to take. I'm still alive because no one seems to see that there is no difference between Iraq and East Oakland, South Side Chicago and South Central, a battalion of young soldiers and the students in my poetry workshop, how no one has mornings like them, how they wake up in their own piss and grief to go to another friend's funeral more times than they even go to class. How the biggest fear for most of my friends is to raise a black child in a justice system of a joke that will continue to say taser when we kept saying gun, that will continue to cry acquittal when we kept crying murder, that will continue to sing God bless America when we kept saying God please. <laughs> Have mercy on all of us. I'm still alive because in the past few years we have lost Nelson Mandela, Amiri Baraka, Maya Angelou, Gabriel Garcias Marquez, Yuri Kochiyama, Grace Lee Boggs, Afeni Shakur, Prince, Aretha Franklin, into Sake Shange, and upon learning of all of their passings, I hung my poetry at half mass. We, artists of the revolution, know that we are on borrowed time, using borrowed words, watching our leaders turn ancestor in our life. I am still alive because whatever wants me dead, y'all, does not know that you cannot kill somebody who isn't afraid anymore. <laughs> Somebody who is ready to leave this place an ancestor. Somebody who is ready to give birth to the generation that will bring about the liberation I was always destined to make, but never meant to see. Thank you. Okay, sis. All right. Um, so, just a quick heads up. I know class is ending in about four minutes, so we'll take one question, and then we're gonna take a ten-minute break for more Q and A. So, does anyone have a one burning question for Teresa before we take a ten-minute break? Don't be scared now. Okay. This section, I heard a lot over here. Anyone have one one question? My question would be is, at the end of the day, you know, whenever, if you've ever lost hope, what continues to tell you to keep pushing for not just yourself, but all these other cultures? Like when you was talking about East Oakland, you know, how you take the whole city and put it on your back like that? Before, um, as I was coming into poetry, most of my formative work was in youth empowerment and youth work. And um, I really just truly gained so much of my energy and my life from working with young people. They have a hope unlike any of us. And the older we get, the worse it becomes for us. We, get, we become more, pa or, uh, more pessimistic, um, less hopeful, more paranoid, and things like that. But kids and young people have this imagination that's just so lively 
um, when you nurture it, when you give a shit, when you take care of them and, 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 and nurture that with them. Um, I truly, you know, when I used to work in East Oakland at, a, at what was deemed the worst school there, it's called Casamon High School, um, there, was, there were times where there were like two shootings a month <laughs> in which the school didn't do nothing, right? And you would think that these kids would lose hope at a drop of a dime, right? Because of the trauma that they have to experience at school and then go home with. Um, but there is something really resilient about young people that feeds all of us, which is why I really truly believe that justice and whatever it looks like, wherever we're going with it, is gonna be led by our, our young people, right? And so I gain it from that, I gain it from being with my nephews and being with just kids, like just the younger people in my life really feed that for me. Um, that's how I, I keep going. <laughs> Thank you for your question. All right, we can take one more question before the break. Anyone else? Or oh, you need some more thinking time? Okay. <laughs> or somebody has a question? Anyone? Oh, Zoe. Hey, Zoe. It's bad taste, bro. It's bad taste. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much for speaking. Um, my question is about your poetry and that. Uh, Sometimes I try to write, and sometimes the words don't really come out the way that I feel because I feel so passionate a lot of the time. And you know, all the things that you go through that I go through too. And it seems like it's really hard to get people to listen. But when you do, it, when you put it in a poem, it's really, you know, much more well received. How do you push through like writer's block and you know making that message so accessible? Check, check, check. Is this on? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. I'm tripping. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. I think doing it for this long, I've been doing it for about 13 years, um, it's like practicing any kind of craft. I would never assume that because I touch a basketball, I can be a basketball player. Same way that no one should assume that just because you write a poem, there isn't a, a skill to it, like a, a practice to like editing and to refining what you're trying to say. And you're right. There's something really powerful that you can say and get across in a poem that isn't always as uh, catchy as someone just saying it out loud to you, right? And so there's, there's an economy to your words. There's a, how do you get to the point fast enough if you know you only got a limited amount of their attention um, in the span of time that you have and whatnot. And so something I, I, I force myself to do is that I don't prescribe to something called writer's block. I don't actually think that's a thing. I think if I feel blocked, um, then I'm, I should be doing other things like reading, or I should be doing other things like conversing with people. But I don't let myself get in the habit of believing that, oh, because I'm blocked, that's why I can't write. I just force myself to write really shitty poems <laughs> until <laughs> stuff comes out. It really is. It's just a practice of like, not every poem's gonna be something I perform. Not every poem's gonna be publishable. Not every poem's gonna hit a stage. But I gotta keep writing. And I think it was Octavia Butler. Anyone know Oct Octavia Butler in here? Where she, she talked a lot about how um, habit is more uh, sustainable than inspiration. Like habit will get you to finish your shit. <laughs> ha like doing it habitually over and over again, just moving that muscle and exercising that muscle, like any muscle you exercise at a gym or whatnot, is the only way it gets stronger, right? Even if it means a few bad first drafts. And so, yep, that's, uh, that's, all, that's what I, I have to say, is just really just trying it out and, and not self-editing as you're doing it, just really freely getting all, even if it's passionate, just getting it all on the page and looking at it later, puzzle piecing it later. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. All right. It's 11.52, I know some of you have to transition out to your next class, but before you leave, um, we are gonna take a 10 minute break, so those who are gonna stick around, just think of some more questions. We'll have a 30 minute Q&A with Teresa. I have a quick announcement for those of you who are about to walk out. Students of Color Conference is coming up, y'all. Yep, don't leave. <laughs> and so if you would like an application, it's an opportunity, students, um, spring quarter, April 18th through the 20th. Applications are due this Friday, so I encourage you to take an application. If you don't know if you're going to go yet, give it to a friend. Come find myself, Doris, or any of our staff if you have more questions. And yeah, thank you for those of you who are going to class.
So here's my question. As a Samoan American or as a Pacific Islander, how did you convince your parents to do what you're doing? Because I know that for many Pacific Islanders, like parents, they want the best for us. And so usually that means monetary wise. So how did you, you know, start your career or start out this work as a Pacific Islander? Check, check, check. Yeah. Um, to be honest, my parents were not on board with me being so vocal and so um, honest about the things I spoke about in my poetry in the beginning. Um, yeah, the, I come from a really beautiful, rich culture that's also very rigid in terms of respect and young people not always being allowed to uh, speak so freely and express themselves in those ways. Um, anyone else come from similar cultures where there's just like parameters around how you can be? Um, so yeah, going to college though was really um, difficult because I also traversed this belief in college being really individualistic where all college taught me was debate, 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 this is how you get your grade, uh, survival of the fittest and whatnot. And so I started learning and traversing, be, like living on this hyphen of being Samoan and being an American. Um, of coming to college with my culture, but having to leave it at the door in ways where I was with my peers um, and I had to stand up for myself and I had to speak on my behalf. And then I would go home and my parents wouldn't recognize me or would, would always wonder why I was changing, right? And so not only did I carry imposter syndrome, I also carried survivor's guilt in a lot of ways where I came back home and my parents weren't recognizing uh, or weren't able to communicate with me as, as easily as before. It got to the point where my career in poetry um, really took off in terms of exposure when um, my, my poems first started hitting YouTube. And YouTube became what it was at the height of spoken word poetry um, getting onto YouTube um, through a, a, a medium called Button Poetry. And so there were times in which the first few poems I had on YouTube were quite undeniable for my parents to shun away from or pretend like they weren't there, right? And so instead of um, letting that be something that caused tension in the household, it actually created conversations because what it did was they started be, um, surrounding themselves in our community with people who have seen my poetry through YouTube's uh, videos and they had nothing but really affirming things to say. And so my parents had to reconcile with themselves around like, well, what are we gonna do, like disown our child while the rest of the community accepts her? <laughs> um, especially about me being queer. There, a lot of my earlier work was very much about um, me coming out. And so that actually served as a platform for us to actually talk about it instead of do what we normally would do, which is not talk about it, sweep it under a rug and whatnot. And so um, YouTube really helped do that. Having my parents take on coming to my shows eventually um, did that. And now it's at a point where my mom like, wants to be my manager and like, <laughs> and she, they're really proud and they're always like, how much are you getting paid? And I'm like, calm down. <laughs> but, but, it, but it really took a communal effort, a village of sorts, right? For them to see like, my daughter being queer is okay and um, her talking about the family doesn't mean she's bashing the family. It's just, she's bringing up issues that everyone is resonating with around like, thank you for bringing it up because we don't tend to talk about it. And so thankfully it served uh, a productive purpose. <laughs> um, over time. It really did take quite a few years, though. Who's next? <laughs> Anybody have questions? Hi, Gracie. Oh, Devita. OK. Uh, my question for you is what, if you were to uh, speak at the White House, now, what would you say and what would you share? It's so interesting because I've dissociated myself with the current administration so much that I don't like giving it power. I don't even say his name. <laughs> I just, um, just find it so hard to um, humanize the administration in ways where they've, they've just constantly dehumanized our entire communities. Um, so it makes it like feel like, I don't want to go to the White House. Um, if I had a chance, I guess, I don't know. I think maybe I'd like come with like a group of young people and we do a group poem or something <laughs> together. Um, I, I think it's just 
so like my, my, the school of thought I come from is that no one is disposable. And if I really truly believe that, that also means the president. <laughs> but I don't know what to do with him at times in my thoughts process. I'm like, I don't know whose responsibility he is, but I know he's not disposable, right? And so, and it's really hard. Um, it's really hard um, to feel like I know that that is the work. I know that the work is actually in the personal and the work is actually being face to face with folks who have differing views than mine and whatnot. And I'm actually finally at a place, I think when I was in college, I was just, straight angry the whole time. <laughs> I had no filters, I had no ways of processing my rage and my trauma. Um, but now I'm, I'm, way, I'm much older and I, I see a responsibility to younger generations of like, what kind of leader am I trying to be, right? And what kind of leader am I trying to model for the young people who, who follow um, and look up to me, right? And so something about that interaction with if I ever were at the White House involves um, a collective group of us together saying something in unison of some sort. And um, which is really typical in poetry, right? In, or in spoken word. And so, whether it be a poem or whether it be a, just a declaration that we exist or a manifesto of some sort <laughs> that we exist and that we're that um, we're here and whatnot, and this is what justice looks like. Um, something around those that realm. Because I think I'm like not about giving him, people power to get reactions out of them. Like I just, it is evident who I am and what I stand for if I just speak my truth. Um, instead of pointing at people about like things they're doing wrong, it is evident who I am and what I believe in if I just speak my truth. And so I've been trying to embody that more and more, especially coming into this new year. So, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to say, I think, especially over the weekend leading up to MLK Day, just online, there's a lot of like performative activism that goes on. A lot of people post quotes on MLK Day and they kind of leave it at that. Um, so I guess my question is, what does it mean to you, like for me, for example, to be a meaningful ally? Check, check, check. Um, that's a good question. That's something I'm always wondering myself, that just because I'm a person of color doesn't mean I'm not, I don't have a responsibility to be an ally to um, so many other communities I don't belong to or that I benefit um, from their marginalization, right? And I think something that I've been taught um, more and more this past year is uh, we don't get to subscribe ourselves as being allies that, uh, to communities that we don't belong to. They, they will tell us if we are allies to them. We have to earn that trust. And so I think that's one thing, is that I've stopped saying I'm an ally to <laughs> groups I don't belong to, and I, I work at what it takes, and I have conversations, and I show up. I like literally, I think physically showing your presence, like going beyond the performative aspect of j just posting. I, don't, I think posting is really valuable. I think social media is really powerful when you utilize it consistently and in a productive way. But I'm oftentimes thinking like, how can I combat the anti-blackness in my own Pacific Islander community? How can I um, be way more than just accessible to folks who are disabled, but like nurture them in being as inclusive as possible and not just it being a ma matter of access through a door, <laughs> you know? Like, and these are things that I've been checked time and time again by the homies, by friends who are like, this is how you can do it. <laughs> um, while also doing my own homework around it, that I don't expect them to educate me the entire time um, around how to show up better. But showing up is key. The showing up part, the actual physical part of showing up, the actual um, posting does help because it shows you know, that you're thinking about something that oftentimes society may not be thinking about. Um, and how, I, how my silence or ignorance around something is implicated in, in not saying something about it, right? And so I'm constantly thinking about things like that. Um, but yeah, I think allyship is a matter of we don't get to decide that we are allies to groups. We, we have to earn that trust and build that rapport. Um, thank you for your words today. Um, 
What is something you told the youth that you worked with at that high school to help them get through what they were going through? I remember because they did not cancel school, for instance, on the week where there was actually a week where there was two shootings at, like one on Monday, one on Thursday, and they didn't cancel, the school district didn't cancel school. Um, and so instead of running the writing workshop as I, as I had intended, I just impromptu bought like a bunch of food <laughs> and circled up the group and we just did some kind of like group therapy, um, which is really helpful to have a background in holding space in those ways where there's so many complex feelings of, of trauma and hurt and this belief that the school didn't care about them, which was really hard to deny because of the actions of the school. And so what came out of it was um, they started having ideas around what they wanted to do as next steps. And so they actually had these ideas of writing letters to the school district. And so kind of following their lead, it was like, okay, let's imagine what those letters could look like and doing like a writing session around that was something we did and listening to music and just creating as safe of an environment as possible, knowing that once they leave school, anything could happen, who knows what's being nurtured when they leave or who knows if anyone's paying attention to these hidden cues that they're, you know, they're embodying but maybe not explicitly saying to a, a trusting adult. Um, young people really, uh, no matter what they say, they really want a space to be heard. <laughs> um, no matter how resistant they feel or whatnot, and, it, and a lot of times it's not gonna come from us asking, it's gonna be just you creating it. Like someone throwing together some chairs and food and saying like this is what we're doing today and they need structure in those ways uh, especially ones who don't come from places where that structure is always consistent or adults have told them things in their lives and they didn't show up right and so i think that's my tactic usually is like they don't want that decision of having to decide what to do for themselves they want to know an adult cares enough to have had an agenda around like okay we're doing this today and and you can control the music or you can do you know have having places where they have agency also uh, and, and compromising in those ways. But yeah, and I, I usually don't know, and this is actually typical with the, with the workshops I run as residencies with youth, is that I actually don't create the curriculum for a school year or for a semester until I am in the room with them, where I like need to sit with them and know who I'm with and every individual in the room before I can determine what being together will look like. And sometimes that's on the fly, sometimes it's just having writing prompts in my back pocket just in case, but um, those moments in which I needed to figure out how to respond, I didn't know until I got into the room. And so, yeah. Um, my question was, was pretty much that, but um, I work at a high school um, they're taking finals right now, so they're fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I work at a high school a few minutes away from here, um, and what, like, the job that, um, it's basically, like, re-engagement and working with students that, um, they don't like school, or, um, they've, better said like they've been pushed out or there's just a lot of trauma there that they don't really know how to process um, and it comes out a lot in um, I just get the feeling that it's a lot of um, like not having that space or um, just not feeling confident or like there's just a lot of lack of love whether that's like in the home or just um, like in the community um, so I guess like because I've done like community work in the community, but not in a school setting, and that's so different. Um, so I guess, like, do you have any like advice for bringing like that community aspect into the school? Because school systems are such shit. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that, and I I agree. I resonate a lot, um, and there's so many parameters in which you got to cover to get the learning goals met and whatnot. Um, and I think that's a reason why I also give it up to teachers for holding that down because I have the privilege of coming maybe once or twice a week to a classroom and being in partnership with a teacher just like twice a week. And I don't 
have to deal with um, meeting all the standards by the school district and whatnot. And I've had the, um, the privilege of working with partner teachers who gave me a lot of like free reign to shape those sessions together with the young people, right? I think just I have to continuously remember um, that their autonomy is so important to them that even when it comes to creating a set of community agreements that they have the agency to create around like what the classroom rules will be and um, they again they really love talking about themselves and so every opportunity where they can brainstorm um, about like big topics that mean the most to them in their age group so a lot of them are really into talking about um, what gossip means in their friends group and what um, stereotypes they face and like and, and what do teachers not understand about them and things like that. And they, get, they really go in on just so much that it feels like they, they've been a pressure cooker this the whole like school day of like wanting to spill <laughs> and express all these really like bigger, deeper feelings, right? And so, and then doing a lot of, just being on my toes about um, activities. So a lot of icebreakers in the beginning, a lot of games that make it, uh, that are corny, but like get them moving and whatnot and get folks laughing and whatnot. And then a lot of like either like partner shares and round robin things or things that, that include music and music videos and things that, and it's, it's interesting because, and I don't know <laughs> if anyone else is a teacher, but the more you teach the same grade, the older you get and they just stay the same age. And so like, I'm like teaching ninth graders every year, but I'm like, I'm getting older. I'm like, I don't know what the lingo is <laughs> anymore or, the, or, or I have them teach me. I'm like, okay, so what is the, like, let's do a workshop on like what y'all talk about or like how, you, what your slang is. And they're like, what do you, what's slang? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know, <laughs> what do you guys call it these days? But, you know, just really like tapping into the culture and also being malleable with yourself of like, this can go a lot of ways, but we're really leaving a lot of room um, to be guided by what they're resonating with, but just continuously remembering like, they really do benefit from like, expressing themselves because they probably don't get it in many other places. And so it, an expression could look like drawing, it could look like free writing, it could look like, um, bringing in things to share or whatnot from, from their lives or whatnot, telling a story about their home or whatnot, um, showing pictures from their Instagram or like using social media as a way to be active, active in, what, in those ways. Those are just some ideas. <laughs> yeah. So you might have already answered this, but what is a, as a person of uh, white passing, how, how do I maneuver being an active voice? What would be the best way to maneuver that? Think <laughs> um, as a person of white passing, does, how is a good, what is a good way to be an active voice without I guess, overshadowing people that aren't as white passing. Do you have any advice? I know you kind of answered something similar, but I'll leave it to you. I can't speak directly as that because that doesn't relate to exactly how I experience it, but from what I've, what I know in being in community with folks um, who are white passing, but part of even my culture and whatnot, um, a lot of active listening, a lot of like listening to um, what f folks who are not white passing um, and who are darker skin and whatnot, um, their, their feelings and, and their attitudes and behaviors towards folks who do hold that privilege of being white pass passing um, is what I lean towards saying first, is that there's even a lot of just in the colorism within my own community that I experience benefiting the, from the privileges of. Um, I have, I didn't share it today, but I, I have poems in which I talk about that a lot too, um, that I grew up really ignorant <laughs> to um, having benefited from being treated differently in my family because I'm full Samoan um, than my cousins who are half black, half Samoan, or half Mexican, half Samoan. And I didn't know. I just thought like, my, I thought my cousins were were, were not lying, but I, I didn't believe them, right? Until until recently, right? And so that was a lesson in needing to listen more and like shutting up about, you know, my own my own hangups around like, well, why why do they feel this way? 
and really listening to the pain. Because <laughs> um, that's what it, what's under the frustration, right? Is like, oh, I'm, I'm actually hurting people I love the most because I'm not, I'm not believing them. And so I think my first inclination is to say, to actively listen and from there, I am confident you'll meet folks who are willing to engage in you being able to ask them directly to around like what, what it could look like for you to be an active voice like you were saying, because I think that is necessary too. Um, or not being a passive bystander in ways where you see other white passing people um, doing something harmful or, doing some, or saying something problematic and those are w ways that you could st step in, right? Um, and, and say and speak up. Yeah, that's what I'll say. All right, we have time for one more question. Anyone? Any, any staff members want to ask? If not, I have a question. Um, <laughs> um, outside of poetry, what's your favorite ways of practicing self care? Weird. Um, I love to dance, um, whether it be like a formal like class or going out with my girls. Um, and I really love the beach, and so I feel really spoiled by California because um, we have easier access to it. And so there's something, and this is also very cliche from being from an island, but there's something very healing about salt water in, in the ocean. And so that's a, a go-to. And then um, cooking. I live by myself and. Um, really have taken pride in not wanting to spend money <laughs> um, and just really teaching myself how to cook but also using it as a really uh, great form of therapy in a lot of ways and um, yeah being proud of what I create <laughs> in a different sense outside of like on the page so cooking the beach dancing <laughs> all right yeah just give it up all right thank you do you have any last words you want to say